Hello and welcome to Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer and CBS Sports commentator, joined today by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. We have a special interview episode for all our listeners today. We are joined today by Executive Director of the National Women's Soccer League Players Association, Megan Burke, and forward for the Chicago Red Stars and active player rep for the NWSL Players Association, Kalia Watt. How are you both? doing today welcome to the show i'm doing great i'm so excited to be on here so thank you for having us we're yeah, excited thank you to, so much we're, we're, we're excited so to have the both of you here uh to just really continue like a really important dialogue um with the two of you on attacking third by extension to all of our great listeners because you know we've been getting a lot of questions in between all of the the coverage that we've been doing in light of all the, the news circulating around the work that the pa is doing and the biggest ones are about always the, the players. It's always coming back to the players and talking about uh, what what's the newest update, what's the latest information, how can can people continue to be supportive and help. But um, just to get things rolling here for for you, Megan, as the executive director of the PA, how how what's your journey here? How did you get involved with this players association? What is your role, and what is the work that you do directly with the players and by extension the league? Yeah, well, well, thank you, uh, Sandra, to you and Lisa for all the awesome coverage. Um, you know, one of the things that I think gets lost in all the off the field news this season is what an incredible season this has been. Um, I mean, frankly, in my lifetime, it's the best soccer I've ever seen at this level. I think that you can't talk about it enough. And I really enjoy following your podcast and talking about the soccer. So thanks for the great coverage. And thanks for having us on. It's really great to be here with Kalia, one of our uh, superstar player representatives. Um, so yes, I have the privilege of being the leader of the labor union that represents the players in NWSL and I'm a former player myself. I played in WSA, WPS, bounced around in between like a lot of players chasing, chasing the game. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I thought that I could try to figure out who I was without soccer for about a decade and, and tried really hard to be a real lawyer. Um, uh, and then I just, you know, can't not do this, I guess. I got drawn back in uh, when this Players Association was organized in 2017 by the players. Uh, it was a completely player-led effort to organize themselves into a labor union. Um, and I just kind of played a background role, whatever players needed at that time. You know, I'd helped organize the WPS Players Union in 2010. Uh, and so I had some background in it. And then over time, you know, the, the pandemic hit, and I guess that's what makes you really stop and think about what you're doing with your life and what you really want to be doing. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to come on first as chief operating officer when Brooke Elby was executive director and before her, yeah, Al Averbush. Um, so I came on, I think April 1st was my first day on the job. We were, you know, kicked off CBA negotiations. Um, so I've been in this role for six plus months now. And, um, you know, obviously quite a bit has happened. I think we've accomplished a lot as a PA, which is a credit to these incredible players that I get to represent. A lot has happened. It's really been emotional, heavy, exhausting, especially the last few weeks since um, Mena, Shim, Shanid Farrelly, those stories were public. Kaya McCullough came forward with her stories and we've been covering it here on Attacking Third. We've been running through the details, informing our listeners and, and everyone of the demands put forth by the PA and just trying to spread the word as best of, as we can. And it, Kalia, it's been exhausting and tiring and a lot for me, but for you, how are you? Yeah, it's been a heavy couple of weeks, I think, for the entire league um, and and everyone following this, really. Um, I think that to see where the PA has come from, I, I was a PA rep. I've been a PA rep the last two years in Chicago, and then I was a PA rep in Houston for two years. So it's been at least four years that I've been involved in the PA. And to see the growth and the evolution of this has been incredible and unbelievable really. And I think that in a situation like this that we've been experiencing the past couple of weeks, I don't think we could have gotten through it as a league without our PA and without Megan, our, our leader. Um, and it's just been really cool to hear there's so many comments and so many players just really saying thank you to the PA because the, it's it's been a tough couple of weeks and we've really looked to Megan to, to 
guide us through this and to, to help us. And at the end of the day, we still have to play and we still have to um, highlight these stories and, and highlight these heroes, these victims that have come forward and while doing our job. So I'm grateful to see the growth in the PA and how we responded to this and to be a part of it. It's been really difficult, but it, it's been really special. Kalia, the, the responsibilities of a, of a player representative, I, I don't think people realize the, the maybe some of the weight that comes with that. There's, especially when a moment like this in time is happening uh, where, where there's such a huge spotlight on, on the league. There's, I'm sure, been a ton of conversations, a ton of meetings between you, Megan, players throughout the leagues over the last few weeks. So throughout all of this, between the meetings, the phone calls, the Zooms, what, what has it meant to you personally to sort of have that responsibility to sort of be this player representative, that liaison? And in between all that, tr- in the middle of a playoff push with these same teammates that you're having to relay different messaging to as well. Yeah, it's been, it's, as I said, it's been difficult, but it's so important. And especially at this time and with a situation like this, all the hours and all the conversations and the work that we put in, it, it's so worth it. There's nothing more important than players being protected and feeling protected and um, really supporting these victims that have come forward Um there's nothing more important than that. And so while it has been draining at times and exhausting and and difficult, it's, this is why we want to be player reps. And this is why we work hard and put all this time in because we want the league to succeed. And the number one thing that needs to happen for the league to succeed is for players to, to be safe. Yeah. And I'll just add that, you know, I have the distinct privilege of getting to bear witness to these conversations um, that players are having. And I don't, when the history books are written about this season, the world will never know just how deep those conversations were, how hard they were, but how enormously thoughtful our players approach this conversation. I mean, there've been hours and hours put into this and, you know, this is, this is unpaid work. Um, that our players are putting in, they are volunteering to do this because they feel called to do this. And they, they are putting the the league on their shoulders and carrying it forward into the future with the time they put into this. And I just am immensely proud to get to just be part of that, to bear witness to it and to um, hopefully play a helpful role in facilitating where we land on, you know, our decision-making process. But um, you know, what I think fans and other people listening should know is that, um, these players, every action we've taken has been driven by players. Um, every, everything we've done outwardly as a PA has been the product of a very thoughtful deliberation and a robust process that um, these players have put an immense amount of time and poured their hearts into. Um, and I'm just enormously grateful to every single one of our player reps and officers who's, who's done the work this season to get us to where we are. And work has been done. There's already been action that we've seen as fans and as players, just outsiders watching this league. Since the news broke, the players have actively been demonstrating, standing together uh, during the matches at the sixth minute mark of the matches. And now it's happening right before a kick. It's a minute of solitude and both teams standing arm in arm at the center circle. Um, It's powerful. It's a very powerful minute for anyone in the stadium watching or, or at home watching on their televisions. How did the players come to this decision to do this type of demonstration, Megan? Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, it was not the first, we didn't start with that idea, you know, um, it had a lot of different iterations and I've, I've read that a few players kind of talked about the different other ideas we had. And, you know, part of it is, I think we're, it, it was the product of starting from a place of being in a lot of pain and, and carrying a lot of weight and just recognizing that we can't just, you know, turn around and go back to playing soccer. Like everything's the same. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I heard Sinead say that we talk about a lot internally as a PA, uh, I heard her say that she feels like her pain now has a purpose. And, you know, if Sinead can feel that way, that her pain has a purpose, we have no business, but to, but to feel at least that, and also the, the mission to carry that forward and to make a difference. And so we really wanted to, 
um, think about what could what could make this new chapter in NWSL feel different than the one before. And it felt important that every idea was heard. It felt like, you know, look, we're not all, we're, we're each human beings who have our own experiences and backgrounds and ideas. And um, all of them are valid and important and have been part of the conversation, but we're also a labor union, which means that we're, you know, a mini democracy. And so we take votes and, you know, majority rules, but we also try for the majority to really hear what the minority might be saying about how, what well, this might, can we tweak this idea or change this uh, concept? You know, at, at one point we talked about stopping the game for the whole six minutes. And, you know, the truth is, I think that was too painful to, to contemplate. Um, that's a long time. And to think that you'd start the game with that heavy six minutes and then turn around and try to play, uh, you know, a meaningful game that has playoff implications um, was, was too much to bear. I think the majority might have been considering that and then at one point considered what that might mean um, for a team that is feeling a different kind of way about it. And, and we felt like we can't do that to any player in this league. The point is not to, you know, inflict more pain, but to try to try to show solidarity and, and provide a place of healing. And so we landed on this idea of the sixth minute because um, it had some substantive meaning in terms of the, the six years that Mana and Sinead had fought to be heard. And, and I just also want to point out that, you know, this idea of collective action and speaking out really started with the Black Women's Players Collective during the Challenge Cup. Um, last year. So, you know, we don't at all claim to, to hold the mantle on collective action or solidarity. Um, we were inspired by that, I think, and, and grew out of that. And um, so, you know, I think players brought a lot of ideas to the table, but this was the one that I think felt right. You know, it's important for what we land on to feel right. And, and it couldn't just be this hollow gesture either. It needed to be a company with substantive change. We feel very strongly that, um, you know, words are just words, we need to see action. And so that's why we we took that action, but simultaneously issued some demands um, that are intended to bring about substantive, meaningful change in our league and potentially in our sport. And so that was, you know, intentional and, and conscious. Um, and our players felt very strongly about it. So I'm, I'm immensely proud of what we landed on, but I will say the process of getting there was a very thoughtful and deliberate one. Before we jump into those demands and what the players want from the league, Kalia, you've been in that circle at the six minute mark before kick standing arm in arm with your opponents that you're about to play against or already have faced against. What are you feeling in that moment? It's, it's, it's heavy really. Um, but it, it's so powerful to look around and really look into the eyes of the players that you play with every day and the players you're about to play against. And um, as Megan said, it was a really long process to get to that demonstration and that solution. And I think that as, as Megan said earlier, it, the difficult part of being a player representative is you, you're representing your team and, and we discuss things and we, we make some decisions, but everything has to go back to your team and they tell you what they think. And then you come back and you re re start pretty much, you know, and that is, that is difficult because there are so many different players in this league. There are so many different experiences. People feel have reacted so differently to this situation. And so it was a lot of work to get to an agreement. And that's why it was so special because we weighed so many options and heard so many stories and experiences. And so to finally get to that and to be in that circle, looking at each other, it's, it is so special and incredible. The, um, you know, I'm, I, I feel very fortunate to be in a, a position as someone who does media in this space and uh, has been covering a local team in, in Chicago and witnessing that moment in the stadium. It is a very, very uh, powerful moment. And whether it was, you know, in the six minute or now being moved um, uh, to kick off, you could just just see the uh, you could just see the emotion that is taking place. And it's it's also very nice to sort of see and, and hear the support um, that players are getting from the fans um, in this moment during, uh, during their, you know, their applause and in, in the stands, uh, for all of you, um, the players associations call to action was to restructure the league in an effort to make systematic changes. 
And one of the biggest changes is, well, the main things is, is that player safety is, is the absolute priority. So in, in the last few weeks, uh, former commissioner Lisa Baird has resigned. There was uh, the uh, formation of a, a three-person executive committee to try to uh, go on a global search. Uh, and there's there's been a number of, of updates that, ha that have happened. But for Megan, we want to kind of pitch this question to you in the bluntest way possible for me to phrase is was 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 she one of the direct issues was was the the inaction from from former commissioner uh, Baird one of the main issues or, or if not where's some of the main internal NWSL issues lie within all of this well, and of course my twin just came running in so I think all your listeners are about to meet uh, my son and daughter who are homesick today but um you know, the honest answer is that when we're talking about systemic failures and systems issues, it's, it's too convenient and easy to blame one person or one actor. Um, when it's a systemic issue of the type we're talking about, it's everyone. And, it, and it's, it's everyone and it's everything. Um, it's, yes, it's true that I think, you know, we saw the emails, we know what happened in 20, earlier this spring. Um, and so, yeah, I do think the commissioner general counsel dropped the ball, um, but I don't think they're the only ones. And I don't think that changing the commission of the gen general counsel solves it. And I actually don't know that NWSL and the board of governors would agree that that fixes the problem, right? Like, you know, we do need a fresh uh, direction. We need to kind of rebuild our league around player safety. And one of the things that I've made pretty clear is that as we rethink the future of NWSL, we need to start with does this keep players safe? Does this promote player safety or not? And if the answer is yes, we move on. It's like a decision tree. Okay, we go through our process. But then at the end, before we actually adopt the proposal or take action, we ask the same question again. Did this advance player safety? Does this keep players safe? And if the answer is no, we go right back to the beginning and start over again. Um, you know, we absolutely think there needs to be a much larger change than just those two roles. Um, you know, the executive committee was a temporary stopgap measure just to kind of keep the league functioning until another step could be taken. Now we have an interim CEO who's been hired, uh, an interim general counsel. But again, that's not the permanent solution either, right? There are whole, whole overhauls of systems that need to be had. Um, and that process is going to take a long time. Um, but what you're seeing with our demands is an insistence on being part of that and having a, a seat at the table, to, so to speak. Megan, the, there there has been so much discussion about uh, <laughs> discussion and, and opinions. People have a lot of opinions about these, and maybe not a lot of solutions or answers. But on how to restructure the the league and and its front office, and and certain changes have already been made. Uh, I've alluded to that that, that three person uh, executive committee, and there was recently the announcement of Marla Messing's hire as the new interim CEO of NWSL. It was just announced uh, as of this recording this week on a on a Monday, October the eighteenth. Uh, but in your opinion. Uh, is Ms. Messing a, a good fit for this role right now, this interim CEO position? You know, what, one of my philosophies is to give people a chance and when people show you who they are to believe them one way or another, you know? Um, it, she hasn't had that opportunity to prove herself yet. It, it, she's brand new in the role. Um, you know, she obviously brings serious credentials into the role. Um, her first moves that she's made, I am very hopeful and encouraged that we're going the right direction, but it's too early, I think, to, to give a report card or, you know, predict the, how this is going to go down. I, I think we need to give her a chance. Um, she's coming into a crisis to manage it and so far has dove in, I would say, two feet, you know, head first, probably. Uh, I know that she's probably sleeping, sleeping very little and constantly on the phone and getting to work and rolling up her sleeves. We need someone who's going to work exceptionally hard in this moment. It's what's demanded of our player representatives, our players, myself, and, and frankly, everyone in NWSL to save our league. And I think we will. Um, I think she's committed to that. You know, whether uh, we'll see, I guess, you know, a couple of weeks, so a couple of months, you know, where we are, then give her a chance to get to work. Um, I'm certainly willing to give her that chance. And I hope that fans and others will too. It's only been a few days since Marla Messing has been in the role since the announcement came out. But one of the first things she did was write a letter 
to the players and to the fans of this league. And in this announcement and throughout this letter, she said that with the NWSL and the board has responded to one of the demands already agreeing that representatives of the players association will have an opportunity to meet with potential commissioner representatives and candidates and, and be heard in the selection of the next commissioner, which was a huge demand set forth by the players association. Um, Kalia, as a player in this league who now has the potential to have a seat at that table when hiring the next commissioner for the league, what do you want from your commissioner of the NWSL? Yeah, I think that first of all, it's huge to even be a part of this conversation. Um, Two years ago, one year ago, this would not be heard of. So we have made huge strides there. Um, You know, even in CBA negotiations, we've been able to be in the room and share our experiences and share directly with the league how we feel. And that has never happened in the past. So that is so important. Um, I think that a, a big thing that we need at this point is transparency. We need, and that's something that has also greatly improved since Megan has, has gotten here is just transparency throughout the league and to the players and, and keeping us informed. You know, I think that for majority of the time I've been in this league, we don't really know what's going on. You know, we would hear things, we would see things on Twitter. We would see things before we've been told anything. So I think it, it's just so important to, to listen to players and to hear players and to keep people informed. Um, and yeah, I think that so far the league has taken the right action, but it cannot stop here. We have to continue to to work towards keeping us safe and improving our league. Like being safe as a player is the bare minimum. We have a lot more work to do than that, but unfortunately right now, that is what we're focused on. Um, adjacent to the announcement of, of messing in this role, uh, the, the PA issued a statement that, that you're working with a league to come to a resolution based on the demands that were put forth uh, back on October 6, uh, whether that was the accountability for anyone uh, who was involved or could have been involved or had knowledge of abuse of power, the, the step back protocol, uh, uh, um, participation in uh, independent investigations, asking for transparency from the league about those investigations um, and reporting. And you, as, as the PA, announced a good faith seven-day extension for the league to find a resolution uh, for Monday the 25th to, to what were essentially uh, eight of those demands. So um, with with one of those already being met with the uh, the players having a say in a potential uh, commissioner, Kalia looking ahead to, to the 25th when the league does eventually respond to some of these demands, what, what comes next from you personally and in the Players Association? Yeah, I think that we um, we were serious about these demands and we will go through every single one and either check them off or not. And, um, you know, again, a lot of it has to do with investigating the league, clubs, coaching staffs, all of that needs to be answered and um, we're, we're serious about that. So I think that it's just going through the list and and demanding this change and demanding that these things be done because that's the way to keep us safe. You know, it just sort of feels like um, this is a real uh, moment for the movement, to put it kind of in a nice little nice little phrasing. But, um, you know, it also sort of feels like this this PA right now in, in this in this time is really taking a huge jump forward, like a leap, like on a rocket ship of, of growth themselves. I mean, um, from the early stages of this PA to now, and uh, this, this, this players union really becoming a recognized affili- affiliated union with the <laughs> CIO. I, I wanted to, to maybe get, get your input on that a little bit, Megan, in terms of how that came to light. What was the journey of becoming a recognized affiliated uh, union for this PA and why was that so important to get done? Well, I think, you know, what's important to understand is that these are workers. Um, Clea is, you know, she's an employee in NWSL, um, and when she shows up for training or to compete for, and with the Red, Red Stars jersey, the fact that she's passionate about it and 
you know, it's a lifelong dream doesn't change the fact that it's a job and um, she's a worker and she, she's entitled to all the same legal protections and minimum standards that any worker is entitled to. Um, you know, there's a really interesting article, I think it was the Atlantic that ran last night about the comparison that we've made about, you know, our professional athletes being workers. And I, I do think that analogy, and I appreciate the article, article pointed this out. I and mean, when you look at what our players are making, you know, these, I just got to point out, these are extraordinary human beings. <laughs> Put aside their, that they are world-class soccer players, they're extraordinary people. And to a person, they're some of the smartest, funniest, most highly educated, creative, motivated, hardest working people you will ever come across. And so RPA and the progress we made is a reflection of that. And the success of NWSL is, is a reflection of that. Um, and so you know, they've chosen to, to do this job where they are vastly underpaid for not just their soccer skills, but just what they could, what other things they could be doing in the world. You know, we have a lot of players who go on to become doctors or lawyers or teachers or start a business or a foundation or, you know, they're PTs or they have kids or, you know, there, there are a million other things these players can do. But in this limited window of time they have in life, you know, they have this opportunity to be a world-class soccer player in what I truly believe is the best soccer you will see in the world. You know, I'll fight anyone on it. <laughs> One through 10, any game of the week. If you're an NWSL fan, you're watching the best soccer in the world. Um, and why we wouldn't want to lean into that, you know, I, I think we should. Um, and so, you know, yeah, the AFL CIO affiliation was really important to us because um, we're inspired by what workers are doing right now to speak out for basic, you know, living wages and health insurance and paid family leave and medical leave and retirement benefits. All those are things that we are fighting for. Um, it's the same fight. And there's really, you know, as workers, um, there's no, there's no advantage to workers to have dissension among us when we have, you know, a lot of common um, needs and objectives and the fights are our fights. So, like you saw the Portland Thorns go out to the picket line um, with the Bakers during that strike. And I will tell you as cool as it was for the Bakers and for the uh, Oregon AFL-CIO that, that the Portland Thorns came out, it was equally, if not more so inspiring to the Portland Thorns who came back and said, man, I was talking to this guy and he was telling me a story. And you know, they were fired up. Um, so, you know, our affiliation with the AFL-CIO is a two-way street. Um, it was not just us having the benefit of becoming part of the largest, largest federation um, of labor unions in the, in the country. Um, and, if, and there are a ton of resources that come with it. Um, you know, to be honest with you, like when we, when this story broke and with everything that's happened, I, I apologize to every journalist and media person out there who I've not responded to. Um, there's a long list. <laughs> I couldn't get through it all, but I was able to reach out to the AFL and say, can I forward you these and help me sift through them and at least respond. You know, they do have resources for a small union like us. It's very helpful, but we're also going to show up for them. Um, you know, McCall Zerboni went down to President Schuler's um, national press briefing last week. And you know, those are those are things that really matter, I think, to be able to be part of the labor movement, um, which, frankly, in this country, uh, if you're in a labor union, if you're a worker fighting for the same basic rights, like we need to put our shoulder to the wheel to change labor laws in this country to make it more worker friendly. And we want to be part of that fight. The fight is happening. The, the gears have already been turning a little bit. And as you alluded to, Megan, there's absolutely no ceiling for these women in this league and, and as athletes, even as it pertains to the league, um, Kalia, specific to you, what do you want as a player in this league to see as the future of the NWSL? I think right now, the biggest thing is getting the CBA done. I think that to be a legitimate league, you have to have a CBA. That is so important. And we're, we're very close. And, um, you know, I think that ever since everything came out and everything has happened, the league has really showed us that they are willing and want to move forward with this and get this done. Um, there's been so much work and time put into that. And it has been so cool to be a part of that as a player. Um, I had no idea that we would be able to be so involved and hear these conversations. And like I said earlier, be in the room speaking on behalf of other players in the league. And so um, after all of our work and everything we've put into that, I think that is the biggest thing for us right now is 
to get this CBA done so that our league can continue to grow and continue to legitimize. Um, and I think that's, that's the way we get better as a league is, is getting this finished. To just sort of wrap up and, and close out, I think is, is probably the, with the biggest question that we've been getting uh, via our listenership, whether it's on our YouTube channels or, or, or via um, our streaming services. Uh, it's, it's a very simple one. It's, it's always what can fans and supporters of this league do to show their continued s- support for the players and the players association? Well, yeah, I'll be happy to answer first. And I'm sure Clay, you've got a thought on that too. I mean, show up, you know, be loud, be rowdy. Um, you know, be a fan. Like we have the most extraordinary fans anywhere. I think, um, I, you know, I feel like we've seen that since the story broke, the Meg Lenhan story ran, what we've seen is fans double down on their support for players. Um, you know, I heard someone say recently, we're not blinking. And I feel like that's the message that fans have sent, that sponsors have sent, that players are sending, um, and so I ask fans to just continue to stand with us, like literally stand with us in the stadiums, watch these extraordinary athletes be fans. Um, you know, I've seen that already happen. I, I would love to see us pack Louisville for the final. You know, um, we look, let me just say to all the fans in Portland, our, we on, that was painful to make that decision. Um, and really it was painful, not because we thought about the business implications, because we thought about the people who'd bought tickets and had made plans and were excited to come see us play. Um, you know, I, I wish I could teleport all those people to Louisville for the final. And, you know, it, that was the hardest part of the decision. The rest of it was an easy one for us. You know, we're fired up to play at Louisville. I don't know if you guys have been to their stadium, but um, man, please come to the game, <laughs> come to the final and show us that, you know, soccer is bigger than one city. It's, it's bigger than one team um, that this league is thriving and, you know, I think Louisville puts on a great show and we're going to have an awesome time. So I would ask fans to show up to every game you can and especially the final on November 20th. Um, Clea, as a player, I'd love to hear how you answer that question. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, Meg. The biggest thing I think is just showing up. That's why we play. And we have some incredible fans in Chicago and to hear them every week is just, it's the reason why we play. It's, it's so special and just continue talking about the game and talking about these players and how incredible the product is. Um, That's the most important thing. And I want to thank every single fan that has stuck by us this year. And, um, you know, I see more fans on Twitter and social media and all over just demanding change from the league. And it's so special to see how much they care about us as players and our safety and, we have the greatest fans in the world. So just continuing to show up and, and support us is, we just do so much. You love to hear, you hear to hear directly. You want to continue your support. You got to show up and show out. You love to hear it. I want to thank the both of you, Kalia Watt, Megan Burke for joining us on Attacking Third today. We appreciate you giving us the time. We know you've been getting a lot of requests and have been very, very busy. And we appreciate you taking the time to enlighten both us and the listenership as well. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. For Sandra Rita and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.